Assalamu alaikum. I don't think I exaggerate when I say that this segment is probably going to be the most revealing segment you have heard on this channel so far. Hopefully there will be more revealing segments in the future, but this one is definitely is the top so far. I hope you stay with us all the way to the end. I promise you it is jam packed with new revelations and new discoveries and new disclosures that you've never heard before. And inshallah, you will learn a lot from this segment on how to apply the methodology and how we can engage the Quran for better purposes, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. This segment is titled Yahya and his mother, Maryam. And I know this is the shock and this is sort of spoiling the ending a little bit, but I need to get you ready, inshallah, so that you appreciate the depth of analysis and research that we provide from directly from the Quran, directly with irrefutable evidence from the Quran, inshallah. We will also deal with a lot of other disclosures, things that you can't expect right now. So please be patient and ready to receive a lot of additional information. I have a small warning to those who are not willing to empty their cup before entering this segment. This segment is going to give you a major, major existential crisis. If you have attached yourself to any of what was written by human beings and you're not willing to accept what Allah is clearly showing us, as I will demonstrate, then you're going to have a major existential crisis. And I don't say this with any sort of happiness. I'm just letting you know that you're in for a really tough ride unless you empty your cup before starting. This is segment part two out of four parts in the series, Isa, son of Maryam, which we started a week ago. The theme of the series is to explore methodical Quranic evidence away from myths, legends, and folklores. So before we start, let's review a couple of disclosures. We base our interpretation on the translation. We base, <laughs> we base our interpretation and translation on the Abrahamic locution. This is a concept that we fully developed within this channel exclusively. You're not going to learn about it from anywhere else. It's directly extracted from the Quran. I hope you go back and revisit the playlist called Abrahamic Locution. We apply the organic Quranic methodology, which is a methodology extracted from within the Quran itself. We don't make it up. We don't have to invent how to deal with the Quran. We don't have to presume that we know what the Quran is better than what the Quran tells us about itself. We accept the truth above all from the Quran alone. If we have other corroborating evidence such as hadith or sirah or any kind of historical documentation and linguistic documentation, that's fine. But the primary source is the Quran above all other sources. I advise you please don't ask questions unless you have watched the whole segment. And not all questions will be answered in this segment. This is part of a four-part series. Remember that we will discuss additional questions in future parts, inshallah. So with that, let's review a little bit what the series is all about. Part one, we discussed Zakaria and his son Yahya. In this part, which is part two, we're discussing Yahya and his mother Maryam, as you shall see. In the third part, which is the one after this one, Isa, his birth and mission. We will talk about a lot of details. There will be a lot of surprises, I promise you. Things that you haven't even thought about are right there in front of our eyes, waiting to be explored. And inshallah, we will disclose them. And part four, we will deal with Isa's death and his potential return. Will he return or not? In this segment, we will start with answering a very critical question, which will be the foundation upon which everything else will unfold, unravel. So all of the hur, all of the ayat about the story of Isa and Yahya and Zakaria and Maryam in the Quran will arrange themselves magically once we answer this single most important question. 
did baby Asa speak from the crib? I know this is shocking to most of you because we are all raised believing that he did. You will see for yourself whether or not he did and whether or not that paragraph from Surah Maryam is actually pointing to baby Isa or not. We will also answer who was Zachariah's woman, of course, Maryam, as I've been saying, and we will give all of the evidence, very clear evidence, inshallah. We will deal with the story of Zachariah and his woman from Surah Maryam first, and then from Surah Al Imran next. And then we will answer a very important question that I left you with during the last part, which is, this parenthetical statement that was put in one of the ayat in Surah Al Imran. Why was it there? Why didn't anyone talk about this? We will answer other questions such as why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe Maryam as in Allah astafaki wa tahharaki wa astafaki twice istafaki in the same ayah? We will answer that question and you will see the evidence for yourself with your own eyes. No guesswork, it will be right there, no controversy, no question marks left about either of these questions. We will answer, of course, a lot of other questions and some of them that you did not even expect. Some questions will be left to the future and we will identify some of these questions. And then in the last part of this segment, which I know is long and I'm really, really happy that you're going to stick with us all the way to the end. Because I promise you at the end, there are some amazing things coming up. Why were we told about Yahya? The answer to this question is a very serious disclosure. You're going to learn for yourself with your own eyes. The last part, we will deal with a heart melting conclusion. Eight lessons of endearment and tenderness in families that we learn from the story of Zachariah, Maryam, Yahya and Isa, inshallah. So get yourself your favorite beverage, find yourself a cozy corner to snuggle in, pay attention to everything that we're saying, get your notebook ready and make sure that you're not disturbed because this is going to be a really, really interesting and fun ride inshallah. So we review a little bit of the Quranic principles for engaging the dhikr. We've covered them fully in part one. I hope you go back to that if you have any doubt about how we engage the dhikr. First in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us specifically about the story that relates to Isa alayhi salam. In yaquluna illa kathiban. Everything they say is but lies. And if we don't believe the Quran, then there's no sense in wasting any time engaging the Quran. Either we believe the Quran or we don't believe the Quran. You have to make a choice before entering the Quran. So in yaquluna illa kathiban, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly telling us Everything they say is a lie. Everything. And I mean everything and you're going to see it for yourself. Everything they told us, which was brought from the corrupted Injil. Let me underline this statement. Which they brought from the corrupted Injil. Yes, it was not based on our beloved وسلم, telling them this or telling them that. They brought the stories written in the books of Tafsir from the corrupted Injil. And then they overimpose those stories over the Quran. I'm not bulldozing anyone. I'm giving you a fair advanced warning. This is the fact. This is the history. And you're going to see it. Everything they say is a lie. Another principle is which we will see in the middle of the story of Zachariah and Maryam and Yahya and Isa in Surat Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly telling us and telling our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Whatever we're bringing you in here in Surah Ali Imran of that story was beyond disclosure, was ghaib, ghaib, listen to that word, unknown. No one knew this at the time it was revealed, which means the corrupted Injil, which existed at that time, was telling a bogus story. So if our tafsir scholars brought that story, they're wrong. They're contradicting this ayah right there in front of us. Did they do it for good intentions, for bad intentions? To be honest with you, I don't care. All I care about is making sure that I point out to you where we have some significant problems in our own tradition books so that we can fix them and keep moving forward and so that we don't burden future generations with the same problems that we have inherited. 
We have to fix it and keep moving forward. And I hope you all join me in supporting this effort instead of criticizing it and labeling me with all sorts of negative names. I don't care what you label me with. I have a Teflon back, to be honest with you. Everything slides off my back. I don't care. The problem is, what will you do with your own children? What will you tell your own grandchildren? Are you going to keep telling them these stories that they don't accept? And as soon as they have the opportunity to revolt, they run away from Islam. And you all know what I'm talking about. So please take this seriously. Learn so we can discuss these stories. Maybe my interpretation is wrong. Improve on them. Maybe the methodology is not complete. Help us make it better. Engage in a positive way, in an active way, instead of criticizing and rejecting everything before you invest any time in learning it. So inshallah, we will continue with the principles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran tells us, Again, Surah Ali Imran, which we're going to discuss today about the story of Zakaria and Yahya and Maryam and Isa. These are the true stories. We're telling you the true stories. Accept the Quran. Don't accept anything else overimposed over the Quran. And then finally, If you follow their fancy after what has come to you of the evidence-based knowledge, then you are certainly among the transgressors. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're all going to shun and avoid being among the transgressors. A few Abrahamic locution reminders, we've discussed in prior segments. And again, this is really relevant because some people insist on coming into the middle of a four-part series, this is part two, without reading anything or learning anything about what we have done in over 80 different segments already on this channel. So that's fine. Let's review a few concepts. If you want to question them, please go back and watch the prior segments. The first concept is about Nabi which we translate as prophet roughly. This is not the best translation, but this is the best word in English that we have. Is someone who is given a divine mission. Mission, not message. A divine mission. He is expected to execute, to carry out a task of some sort or multiple tasks based on an existing scripture. So a Nabi does not exist in the absence of a scripture. There must be a scripture that he applies to perform the mission with which he is tasked. A Rasul, on the other hand, is someone who is given a new scripture of some sort, who is bringing a new scripture to deliver to people, verbatim. And we proved this and we showed you this from the Quran. This definition is very clear in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a messenger and expects to deliver verbatim the message, the scripture. In this role, a Rasul is not tasked with the implementation of the law. A Rasul is not tasked with the implementation. So if someone is Rasul and Nabi, of course they will be tasked with the implementation. But a Rasul by himself, such as Isa, Isa was not tasked with the implementation. He was just a Rasul, bringing a message. So those are some basic details. If you want some more information, refer to this segment that I have in here on the screen. Another concept is the concept of ruh. We've talked about this. It means message or the messenger bringing that message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a divine emissary or the divine message itself. So ruh does not mean spirit, does not mean soul, as they told us, has no basis for that interpretation in the Quran. Ruh in the Quran is very clear and it occurs in over a dozen different ayat. Very clearly, it is the message or the messenger the delivery vehicle or the message itself. So it could be an angel, it could be another person, etc., etc. That's the definition of the word ruh. The definition of the word wahi is the specific divine instructions given to prophets and to others, other people. So for example, we will see inshallah when we talk about different prophets, they are given instructions. This instruction is called wahi. But there are other people, such as the mother of Musa. She was given a wahi and other people that we will see, inshallah, in the future. And finally, we talked about the gentle breath in the ear. Nufikha fissur. This is a concept that we explored a little bit in the last part of the prior series, part 3.5 of the series, Why No Stories Equal No Quran. 
and we explored even further in the very first part of this series, part one of Isa, son of Maryam. So please go back to this. But basically, a single gentle breath is blown into the curved instrument, which is the ear. A sur is not the horn that we were led to believe. It means the curved instrument, which is right here on our head. And all of the references to hearing or blowing in the sur, in this curved instrument, refer to this divine revelation that we all receive, especially during the days that I talked about in prior segments. So refer to why no stories equal no Quran part 3.5 if you want to learn more about that. Please do not belie that which you do not understand. If you don't take the time to really understand this very, very complex subject and very involved set of evidences in this segment, please don't belie it. It's for your own good. Don't block yourself from believing that which you don't understand. So admit, I don't understand it. Tell me the evidence is not clear. That's fine. I accept that. But don't argue against something you don't understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in Surah Yunus, بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِمَا لَمْ يُحِيطُوا بِعِلْمِهِ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِهِمْ تَأْوِيلُهُ They belied that which they did not comprehend and they had yet to receive its interpretation. Meaning they could not handle the interpretation. Not because the interpretation is not given. They did not have the ability to receive it. So therefore, don't belie it. Admit that you are short on these abilities. That's how those before them have belied too. And thus, look at how the outcome for a zalimin is going to be, for the transgressors. Please don't be among the zalimin. Give yourself time. Be patient with yourself. Allow yourself the opportunity to learn, even if you have to watch this segment 10 times. I promise you it's worth it. It is really critical to everything else that's going to come later in your own life and in the lives of your own children and grandchildren. All right, so enough introductions. And we will start with the part that I told you about. Did baby Isa speak from the crib in defense of his mother? Who actually spoke in Ayah 19, 27 to 32? from Surat Maryam? And the answer is, it was Yahya. I'm going to give you the answer and we'll dive into the details. We really need to answer this question straightforward, head on, with all the evidence, all the markings, and inshallah you will see it for yourself. So we'll get started with Ayah 27, which comes after the scene that we were told Maryam went by the palm tree and she had this river and the falling dates and all of this stuff. We will leave that part of the scene till next segment. Only the part about being near that palm tree. That part, we will deal with it in the next segment because it's dealing with advanced topics that we need to build to understand. So we're starting with the part where she came to her people, supposedly with baby Isa. We're going to see. All right. So that's Ayah 27. So bring your Quran, make sure you keep notes of what we're doing. We're going to jump into a lot of different parts that are sprinkled throughout the two or three different surahs that we're discussing so that we can assemble them in the right order and understand them clearly. So please be patient. There's a lot of new techniques that we're using for the first time in this segment. So Ayah 27 starts. فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ قَالُوا يَا مَرْيَمُ لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَّا I'm highlighting all sorts of different colors so you can keep track of exactly how I translate different expressions and different words. And thus she brought him forth to her original community, قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ Taking the burden for him. They said, Oh Maryam, you have presented something concocted. And right away, I know that a lot of my Arabic-speaking brothers are wondering, where am I coming up with these translations? Just be patient. I'm going to show you, as we do in every segment. Every word, every expression, we give you the foundation. Why we came up with this translation. Why this interpretation is the most valid interpretation based on on the Quranic methodology that we're using. So we take the first part of the ayah, فَأَتَتْ بِهِ We go down to the notes, فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ We're dealing with this part, فَأَتَتْ بِهِ The meaning of فَأَتَتْ بِهِ مَعْنَا أَتَتْ بِهِ أَظْهَرَتْهُ She exposed him or she brought him forth. She let people 
recognize or realize what's going on. That's the meaning in a metaphorical way of atat bihi. Of course, the expression ata bi or atat bihi or yati bihi could mean literally to accompany him physically along, but not always. So we cannot determine unless we understand the context exactly if the physical accompaniment is indicated, is warranted, is justified, or if it is to expose him or to bring him forth. So both occur in the Quran. And here are some examples from Surah Luqman, which we covered, if you remember, in part one. Ya bunayya innaha intaku mithqala habbatin min khardalin fatakum fi sakhratin aw fi samawati aw fi al-ard ya'ti biha Allah. O my son, if anything of the weight, weight, remember, we're talking about weight, we're not talking about something physical, the weight of it, the weight of mustard seed. And even if it were in the way of those whose cores are impenetrable, like a boulder, remember we talked about this in the last part. Don't question this interpretation unless you watch part one. A boulder or in the way of the layers of understanding with the scripture, know that Allah will bring it forth, bring it forth. Allah does not carry it and bring it to your attention physically. Of course, that's not what the ayah is talking about. The ayah is talking about letting you understand all of that stuff that the ayah is talking about. So, Ya'ti biha Allah is metaphorical for sure. It is not talking about a physical Allah carrying it, astaghfirullah, and bringing it and putting it in front of you. And to confirm this, in Allah latifun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most subtle, all aware, khabir. So he's not talking about physical things, he's talking about knowledge and information and ilm. This is what the ayah is talking about. And this was an instruction from Luqman to his son, as we said, that was Zakariya and Yahya. Another ayah is from Surah Al-Baqarah 2 to 58. Qala Ibrahimu fa inna Allah yati bi shamsi min al-mashriq fa'ti biha min al-maghrib. Fa'ti biha. Right there. So Ibrahim was having this conversation with this oppressor that he met. And Ibrahim told him, Allah brings the sun from the east, from the sunrise. Go ahead and you bring it from the west. Of course, he's not talking about the king going to pick up the sun and bring it physically. This is a metaphorical representation, meaning let it appear from the west and so on. And I have a number of other examples in here. For those of you who want to follow through, do the investigation by yourself and you will realize exactly that the word fa'atat bihi, fa'atat bihi is really talking about exposing. Exposing whom? We will see inshallah. So now, qawmaha, her community, we've talked about this in many different segments before. Tahmiluhu, we've talked about this when we talked about Surah Al-Masad. Hamalat al-Hatab is not really talking about physically carrying the wood or the firewood. We talked about Hamala in the Quran, meaning to take the burden, to carry the burden for someone or for something. So therefore, in here, she's taking the burden for him. Who is she talking about? We will see. We will understand exactly. Don't think you already know. Empty your cup. Throw away what you think you know. So you let the Quran talk to us, explain to us. And they said, Maryam, you have presented like jiti. You have approached or came to us with something concocted. Fariyan. Where did we get fariyan? It's from the verb iftara. Faraya to make up a lie. Iftara. So the word iftara is used a lot in the Quran. This is from the same root, fariyan, that means concocted. So they're talking about some report, some explanation she gave. So they're telling her what you have given us as an explanation to what you're bringing forth is a lie. So therefore, they're not talking about the act itself. They're talking about belying what she told them. Right there is the first information for this ayah. The second ayah is, they talked to her, they said, Ya Ukhta Harun, ma kana abuki imra'a saw'in, wa ma kanat ummuki baghiyan. O oh, sister of Harun, your father was not a subordinate to a regime of aberration, imra'a saw'in, that's what the word saw' mean, a regime of aberration. From su, which is the singular act, Saw is the whole regime, is the whole system, a group of people over time doing su'. 
And also, your mother was not a harlot. Your, your mother was not baghiyan. This is what the word means. Now, I'm not going to dive into this a lot. Know that the word sister in here is not biological sister. The Quran uses akhu, ikhwa, ikhwan in many, many different places to indicate that this is not a biological relationship, but more of a spiritual relationship. So the same thing, ukht in here, they're not talking about a biological relationship. Please don't let your mind be so confined to the very limited interpretation of each word. The Quran makes a habit of using a lot of analogies and a lot of metaphorical references as we have seen in so many different ayat. So this is a metaphorical sisterhood, not a physical, biological sisterhood. I don't want anyone to think that Quran makes such a simple mistake of assuming that Mary is the actual biological sister of Harun who came over a thousand years later. So this is obviously not what the Quran is talking about. All right. فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيًّا There are several things here that we need to unpack very carefully, very slowly. And thus, she referred them to him. Hmm. She did not point to him? No. No. She referred them to him. Listen carefully. The verb أَشَارَتْ is from the gerund shawara, And this gerund is exclusively used in the Quran to mean consultation and advice and giving the opinion to another person to lead. That's shawara. So asharat ilay is not pointing to him. That's in traditional Arabic of the 7th century Arabs, yes. But in the Quranic locution, it's never used in that meaning. Asharat ilayhi, that means she gave him the lead opinion. She told them, he gives you the information. He gives you the conclusion within our family. And you're going to see it. The word ilayhi is also used in Surah An-Naml to give us the same sense, the same taste of how the Quran uses the ilayhi. So, قَالُوا نَحْنُ أُلُوا قُوَّةٍ وَأُلُوا بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ وَالْأَمْرُ إِلَيْكِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about this group of people around the Queen of Sheba. When she received the message from Sulaiman, she consulted them. She consulted them, but they referred the final opinion to her. They said, the opinion or the matter goes back to you. Ilayki. This is the exact same ilayhi used in here. Is this a definite proof? No. It's learning the style of the Quran, how the Quran uses such words. So, فَأَشَارَتْ ilayhi. That means she gave the final opinion to him. She gave her advice or her opinion and she let him be the final opinion giver to those people. How do we know this? Because their answer explains it. They said, قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ صَبِيًّا Aha, fil Mahdi. Dr. Hani, you're saying fil Mahdi. That means in the crib. No, it does not. This is not Quranic locution. Just wait. Qalu, they said, how shall we address, how shall we converse with someone who has been, has been, kana, past tense, upon the way of the scripture since being a boy? Why do you say the way of the scripture? Because the word Al-Mahd is consistently used in the Quran to refer to Ard, which we defined very clearly as the scripture. Al-Nas, the scripture text. So you need to see evidence of Al-Mahd. Let's go down. I have it ready for you and inshallah we will review the ayat. Again, this is not a marking. Be careful because it's also used for Isa. It is not a marking, but it's used in the same Meaning, it's used in the meaning that Isa was also studying the scripture, and you will see, inshallah. So, Al Mahd is the scripture. How do we know this? Here's one ayah, Surah Al Zukhruf. There are many ayat, by the way. I only selected a few. Surah Al Zukhruf 43, ayah 10. Alladhi ja'ala lakum al arda mahdan wa ja'ala lakum fiha subulan la'allakum tahtadun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you or made ard, which is the scripture for you as a mahd. Mahd is not a crib in here. Mahd is a prelude, a way to enter into knowledge, 
through the scripture. As we keep saying, so Mahd is a metaphorical representation. It doesn't literally mean the baby's crib. She didn't have a baby crib. She was already coming from a desert place where she was worried how she's going to deal with this. So obviously she didn't have furniture. She didn't have any of this stuff. The Quran is not talking about that stuff. It's talking about this definition of the Mahd, which is a prelude, a way to enter into the interpretation and engagement of Al-Ard, which is the scripture. Here's another ayah from Surah 20, ayah 53. الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مَهْدًا Exactly the same thing. And then finally, وَالْأَرْضَ فَرَشْنَاهَا فَنِعْمَ الْمَاهِدُونَ 51, 48. Again, the same concept. All of those concepts based on the word Al-Mahd refer to Al-Ard, the scripture. And thus the ayah from Surah Maryam is talking about Al-Mahd as the scripture. What does that mean? Well, it means they realize that this person, to ask him to finalize the opinion or how to deal with the situation, that person has been studying the scripture since he was a boy, Sabiyan. Ah, Sabiyan, where did we see this? We saw this in the opening part of the description of Yahya after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, about how his father Zechariah was given the good news. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ صَبِيًّا This is the first marking that gives us a clear indication. The one we're talking about in here is not Isa. Isa is never described as Sabiyan in the Quran. Yahya is. Yahya is clearly with her in this scene. This is the first revelation. I hope you accept this. Empty your cup. Throw away everything you were told. It was wrong. Here's the evidence. and I'm going to give you more and more and more markings and detailed proofs. The second evidence. Man kana. They told us the baby was in her arms and they're saying he was in the crib right now. He was a baby right now and he's speaking as a baby. That's what they taught us in the books of Tafsir. As a matter of fact, I myself have peddled this erroneous stories for over 20 years before stopping to think, no, this could not be what the Quran is talking about. So what is going on here? Kana is a past tense. If they're talking about someone right there in front of them, watching him as they told us he's going to talk very soon, they would have said, who is in the crib? Man fil mahdi. Right now. And they wouldn't have said Sabiyan, meaning a boy. They would have said a baby, Tiflan, which the Quran uses, Tiflan. And yet the ayah doesn't say Tiflan, a baby, doesn't say he is. The Quran says that he was, he was raised Fil Mahdi. Well, Fil Mahdi means in the crib or in the earth. No, because the preposition Fi means many different types of meanings in the Quran. For example, the very last ayah in Surah Al-Ankabut, as I mentioned before, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا فِيْنَا فِي The same preposition that means upon us. That means in the way of the way we prescribed. So, فِي الْمَهْدِي Upon the scripture, meaning studying the scripture. Since he was a boy. And this is clearly Yahya. This is clearly Yahya. It's a very clear marking right in front of you. So those of you who told me it was Isa the same as Yahya, no. This is a separate person. Ayah 685, as we will see from Surah Al-An'am, clearly tell us that Yahya and Isa are two different people because they are mentioned and numerated in the same ayah. So they cannot be the same person. Is that it? No, there's a lot more. So we continue the ayah number 30. قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ Just be patient. I underline this because it's a marking to something else. Phenomenal something else. You will see. قَالَ إِنِّي عَبْدُ اللَّهِ آتَانِيَ الْكِتَابِ Over there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, earlier in the story of Zakariya and Yahya, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحُكْمَ The linguistic discernment of the message of the scripture. So it's clear marking. آتَانِيَ الْكِتَابِ وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيًّا A prophet. A prophet, Nabi, we talked about the difference between Nabi and Rasul. Is Isa ever anywhere in the Quran called a Nabi? The answer is no, never. Check every ayah you want in the Quran. He's never mentioned or associated with a list of Nabi. Isa is described as 
Rasulan ila bani Israel. A Rasul to bani Israel. Very clear. So this is not Isa. This is Yahya, who is also described as a Nabi. So this is another marking. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيًّا And he made me blessed wherever I may be. And he enjoined upon me salat and purification as long as I am alive. As long as I am alive, yes. Because this is a property of the man who died a hundred years that we talked about before. That same man, ayatan linnas, is also described in Surah Maryam as we will see. وَلِنَجْعَلَهُ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ is a very unique marking that is shared between Yahya and the man who died a hundred years. I know a million questions are going and running through your head right now. Just be patient because we have a lot to cover as I promise. So just be patient. Keep that pencil working over your notepad and then be patient. Take some questions and, and we will continue inshaAllah. So as zakat over there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Yahya as you're gonna see it. Wabarram biwalidati, wabarram biwalidati. Well, Yahya was wabarram biwalidayhi. That's how he was described in the segment that we saw from last time in the in the first part of Surah Maryam. So what's going on? The answer is, as you will see from Surah Ali Imran, his father was no longer in the picture. So literally, his mother and Yahya went back to her people. And this is exactly what this first ayah is talking about. So let's review it again. فَأَتَتْ بِهِ She brought him out exposing him, exposing who he was. Who was he? He was the son of Zechariah. Well, what do you mean? You married Zechariah? You were together with him? Yes, I was his woman. And they told her, no, you came up with something concocted. They belied her and they proceeded to accuse her, a very derogatory type of ac accusation, as we will see insha'Allah. So we will leave this ayah to discuss it when we discuss the story of Musa. But no, this is not an expression of endearment. It's not something out of respect they're saying to Maryam. They're saying, you are a bad person. They're accusing her. They're really harassing her. This is not a set of nice expressions to say to Maryam. This is an accusatory, really horrible type of spreading information about Maryam. That's what they said. So now this ayah makes sense and we continue with the last part. And he did not make me overbearing nor disconnected from Allah. Remember shaqiyan. Shaqiyan is the opposite of shakur. So shakur is to have the right connection and communication with Allah. Shaqiyan is the opposite of it. Sort of like shaitan. So when Zakaria talked about وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيًّا It's exactly the same word. The same word that this person, Yahya, learned from his father. So he's saying, وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَتِي I have constancy of faith through my mother. And I told you, وَالِدَيْهِ Both of them provided him constancy of faith. So the constancy of faith that he's talking about right here is because his father, as I said, was no longer part of the picture. And we saw Barram Biwalidayhi earlier in the part that we discussed about Zakaria and Yahya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that marking. So this is the same marking, except his father is no longer in the picture. Why? You will see. Surah Al-Imran does not leave any room for guessing. We will see it with our own eyes and we don't need to make it up. We don't need to invent fill in the blank kind of details. It's all there. We just need to decipher it and to assemble this puzzle in the right way, inshallah. So I hope you're patient and you keep taking notes. And again, if you have questions, we will deal with them maybe in the next segment, inshallah. Finally, something really fun that will shock you and surprise you. When we talked about jinn and iblis and the following segment, which, which was about jinn and the seven gateways of Jahannam, and then the third segment, which was about shaitan, I explained to you that Surah Al-Jinn, Surah number 72, deals with a group of people who were followers of Musa. It wasn't about some unknown creatures that hide in the dark, etc., etc. It was all metaphorical language describing the people who follow the ways of Iblis becoming jinn. And that specific group of people mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn is about a group of people, followers of Musa. How do we know this? 
because right here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us another marking. Yahya is speaking as I have just demonstrated. He calls himself Abdullah. Abdullah. This exact same marking is only used one other time in Surah Al-Jinn. And this ayah says, وَأَنَّهُ لَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لَبَدًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the jinn said or confessed that when Yahya rose as a prophet to them, they almost jumped all over him to kill him. So this is a very clear marking that that group of people in Surah Al-Jinn have something to do with the time of Yahya. This is a very clear marking right in front of your eyes. Go check it out. Abdullah, this expression right here is never mentioned anywhere else in the Quran other than in these two locations that I just gave you. It's a fun little fact. I always tell you that I give you the markings, but I keep something behind my back all the time because there are some advanced topics. Had I given you this marking at that time, you wouldn't have believed me because I needed to prove to you that this Abdullah is actually Yahya. So Abdullah in here is Yahya. Abdullah in Surah Al-Jinn is also Yahya. And the jinn, meaning the followers of Musa, were talking about him. Which means this is a group of people who lived during the life of our beloved Sallallahu because the surah is talking about meeting or discussions between our beloved and this group of jinn. So I hope this is closing the subject once and for all. There is no unknown separate creatures called jinn. They are part of human beings who follow Iblis. In this case, they are part of a group of people who are followers of Musa and who came and confessed to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all of the things that they used to do and they used to believe. Yes, I changed my glasses. I, the other ones were giving me a little bit of a hard time. So this is the part that I'm really, really excited about. When Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala first revealed this to me, I was literally standing up and jumping and dancing because it's something that's so in front of us and yet nobody has been able to see this. Nobody has been given the ability to see this. You're going to be amazed. I promise you. If you know a little bit of Arabic, this is going to be, wow, how come nobody saw this before? This is the tafsil that cracks the whole story wide open for me. Initially, when I first discovered this, I thought, whoa, everything we knew is wrong. Everything we knew has to be revisited. And indeed, it turned out that everything they told us about this story was wrong. Watch this. This is a part that we discussed earlier, but I had left one last A and I told you this is wrong translation. This is the correct translation and you're going to see for yourself how relevant it is to the story that we are sharing with you about the family of Zachariah and Maryam and Isa and Yahya. قَالَ رَبِّ أَنَّا يَكُونُ لِي غُلَامٌ وَكَانَتِ امْرَأَتِي عَاقِرًا وَقَدْ بَلَغْتُ مِنَ الْكِبَرِ عِتِيًّا We explained all of these terms. I don't want anyone to ask me about them in this video. If you really need to know why I translated them this way, go back to part one, full details available. My Lord, how would I have a ghulam, a young man, while my subordinate woman has been pinned down, and we said عَاقِرًا, does not mean barren, does not mean she cannot have children or infertile. It meant pinned down as they do to the naqa. Aqaran naqa, that means pin her down. And after I have reached an escalation of excessive arrogance from the elders. Al-Kibar is not about his own old age. It's about the group of people who are the leaders in his community. And the proof we gave is Aitiyan. All right, ayah number nine. Qala kathalika. Allah said, that's exactly how. قَالَ رَبُّكَ هُوَ عَلَيَّ هَيِّنٌ This is a marking we're going to see. Pay attention to this one. Your Lord says, it is easy for me. And I have created you too before in the same way, while before you were yet to be willed into existence. وَقَدْ خَلَقْتُكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَلَمْ تَكُ شَيْئًا We talked about this in the part one of the series. Now, this is the new revelation. Watch this. قَالَ رَبِّ جَعَلْ لِي آيَةً They told us this part, designate a sign for me, was a challenge from Zakariya to Allah. Wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling us this story to tell us how Zakariya challenged Allah. 
has nothing to do with Zakaria challenging Allah because he just finished supplicating to Allah, asking him for a ghulam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the good news. And then he asked, how am I going to have this, etc. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered him. And then he says, designate a sign for me, a signal. What is that sign? قَالَ آيَتُكَ أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ النَّاسَ ثَلَاثَ لَيَالٍ سَوِيًّا Watch this. This is the magic. This is the magic that changes everything. The verb تُكَلِّمَ is in the Arabic morphology indicative of two different things. And depending on the context, it's either this one or that one. So you can say أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ That means you don't speak. As if the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to Zakaria is about him, second person, being addressed. You should not speak. It also means she does not speak or she should not speak. Ah, so now this ayah is not talking about Zakaria. It's talking about a she. Who is she? Well, he just finished telling us a little earlier about Imra'ati, my woman, right here. Imra'ati. So what is the sign that Zakaria is asking for? This is the beautiful part. The part that we are talking about in this ayah is that Zakaria is saying, okay, I will have this child with my woman, who is Maryam, but how do I know that she's in agreement? So give me a sign, some sign that says she will agree to it. Qala Rabbi Jalli ayah, give me a sign. It's so beautiful, it's so touching. Give me a sign that she's okay with this. I don't want to force myself upon her. Give me a sign. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, She will not talk to anyone for three nights, sawiyan, straight. Hmm, three nights. Well, how would Zakaria know about her silence during the night if she's not with him? The answer is she was with him and we're going to see it. Because in Surah Ali Imran, the exact same expression, Allah to kalima, she should not speak for three days. For three days. In other words, over there it's days, here it's nights, that means days and nights they were constantly together. And thus, Aqiran, she's pinned down, she's always with me. This is the beauty of the Quran. This is the, the wonderful connectiveness between the ayat, this linking that keeps stunning you every time you discover it. It is just unbelievable that people have missed this. They just brought the fake stories and imposed them over the Quran and brought down the level of intellect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, astaghfirullah, down to their low intellect. They told us Zakaria was being punished for questioning Allah. And therefore he was told, you must remain for three days and three nights unable to speak and not speak to anyone. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very merciful. He was giving him assurance, just like he gave Ibrahim assurance when Ibrahim asked. But those who don't want us to ask are telling us these fake stories. The Quran is so tender and so beautiful that he was sensitive to the needs of this woman with him. He described her as aqiran, he felt sorry for her, and he's so sensitive to her needs, he wants to make sure he, do he doesn't impose himself over her. So he asked Allah, help me with a sign. You will see the sign. The beautiful story unfolds and as we continue. This is the ayah from Surah Al-Imran, Qala Rabbi Jalli ayah. قَالَ آيَتُكَ أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ النَّاسَ Same thing as we saw in here. أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ النَّاسَ She should not talk for three days except in signals and engage the dhikr a lot and follow the way in prayer during evenings and mornings. SubhanAllah, the Qur'an tells us that when people who really appreciate and understand the Qur'an, you see their eyes overflowing with tears, tears of joy, tears of happiness, Tears of connectedness with Allah. And I hope you are feeling it right now as we speak. This is phenomenal discovery, disclosure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to understand the true story of what's going on. Such a marvelous, beautiful story. And then we continue with this very important signal in here from Surah Ali Imran, from the same type of scene. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ كَثِيرًا 
وسبح بالعشي والإبكار and follow the way in prayer during evenings and mornings. This is clearly addressing Zakaria. You should do this. And that's why we said when we talked about the same scene earlier, فَخَرَجَ عَلَى قَوْمِهِ He came out against his community. فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ Allah instructed him just like he is instructing him right here in this ayah. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ كَثِيرًا وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِيِّ وَالْإِبْكَارِ Again, the consistency is uncanny. The integration among the ayat doesn't leave any room for doubt whatsoever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story, tells us another version of the same story, but they integrate and fit so well together, like pieces of the puzzle coming together to make us believe the whole thing and to understand the whole thing. So what was missing in one part of the story is provided in the other part of the story and vice versa. Unless you are really engaging the Quran fully aware, fully awake, making sure you don't underestimate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making sure you don't belie the Quran, making sure you don't take one part and forget about the rest, you don't understand these stories. This is why engagement of the Quran takes time and patience and diligence and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discloses these facts. How many people in the past 1400 years have seen and read this expression right here and every single one of them was not allowed by Allah to see it as addressing about her third person feminine. Hiya tukallim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the information to whomever he pleases. Our responsibility is to share it. Now, one last comment here before we move on. We will see the same tafsil, the same kind of tafsil, where a word appears to be in the masculine form, but it's actually in a third person feminine form. We will see this again in the third part of the series. So remember this tafsil, this bayina that I just shared with you. All right, continuing with the story of Yahya. Again, refer to part one if you want to see the details. Here's the ayah that I was telling you about. فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ مِنَ الْمِحْرَابِ فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ Allah instructed them. Awha gave them the enjoyment, the instructions. سَبِّحُوا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيَّةً As we just saw, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the instruction to Zakariya in Surah Ali Imran. This is Surah Maryam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awha to all of them. That's why I am 100% confident that this awha, the subject of it, is not Zakariya. It's Allah. That's why we translated it with full confidence because Allah told us that Allah gave the instructions to Zakaria in Surah Ali Amra. So when we put together the, the two descriptions of the same scene, it leaves no doubt whatsoever. Ya Yahya khudhi al-kitaba biquwwatin wa atainahu al-hukma sabiyya. We discussed all of this stuff. Sabiyan is a marking. Atainahu al-hukma. The linguistic discernment is a marking. And we just saw all of these things when we discussed the question, who was with Maryam when she went back to her community? By the way, we're going to continue that, that segment and we're going to understand more, inshallah. But first, we're, gonna take it, we're taking it one step at a time to unravel the hur. وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَيْهِ Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the constancy of faith through his two parents. But over there in that segment that we just discussed, she was alone with him. He did not have his father with them. So therefore he says, بَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي My mother. So that was not Isa speaking, that was Yahya speaking. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وُلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ يُبْعَثُ حَيَّا And I translated it exclusivity as I described it and detailed it in part one. I don't want anyone to write me peace and all of that stuff. It's not. Leave those interpretations that are really not based on the Quran aside and go back to part one to learn. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ وَلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ يَبْعَثُ حَيًّا Exclusivity is given to him on the day he was born, on the day he dies, and on the day he's raised to life. This is not a marking and this is where most of you have made a mistake in trying to seek who was the man who died a hundred years. Yes, it was Yahya and Yahya is separate than Isa. This is the part that tricked you because in the description of Isa, which we're going to see a little later, he himself says, As-salamu, as-salamu, as-salamu. There is a definite article preceding Salamun. 
And those two are not the same thing. Salamun and as-salamu don't mean the same thing as we will see. So this is clearly Yahya and this is not a marking. Over there, it's a separate, different type of expression. And Yahya is not the same person as Isa, as I explained to you earlier. 685, Ayah 685 mentions Yahya and Isa in the same Ayah. Therefore, they're not the same person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-An'am, Ayah 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe all of these listed in here. Among them, Yahya and Isa are Salihin. Salihin are those who toil on the scripture in accordance with the divine lexicon. We've talked about this many, many, many times before. Amilu Salihat. The word Salaha means a terminology according to the Abrahamic locution. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anbiya 2190 also is talking about Zakariya. Zakariya made a dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We dignified his supplication. And we granted him Yahya. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ Yahya. We granted him Yahya. And we made his pair, زَوْجَهُ صَالِحِينَ وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ I know some of you are going to complain right away because none of the translations and none of the interpretations gave you this explanation that I'm giving you in here. But let me justify it. Be patient. Listen. Learn. So you can, you can develop this certainty, yaqeen, confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mislead us. Human beings can make up their own mind, but Allah does not mislead us. Allah is very clear. If you follow the rules, the Quran is mubeen, very clarifying. It clarifies itself. So, aslahna and salihin is a clear marking. And this is the part that we need to see. Yahya and Isa, there's two of them. So therefore, zawj, I translated it as pair. Why zawjahu is pair, not counterpart? Because as you will see, Maryam, his woman, was already among the salihin. So this is not zawjahu, meaning his, his counterpart, or Zakaria's counterpart, meaning Maryam or Imra'atahu. Remember, she's not barren. So they thought that aslaha means to repair, to amend, to fix, to rehabilitate, to make her fit for having children, to adjust her. Those are all the translations. And they conform to what the books of Tafsir said. Why? Because to them, Aqir, that means barren. I've proven to you, Aqir does not mean barren. Aqim means barren. And it is used in the Quran. Aqir, when it's applicable to his woman, to Zakaria's woman, means pinned down. And therefore, Aslahna does not mean to repair. Aslahna, that means made them salihin. And therefore, it's talking about a pair. A pair of salihin, zawjahu, who are mentioned right here. Yahya and Isa. So it's very clear that we're talking about two people, not just one person. I hope it's very, very clear. It's so beautiful. It's so much fun to uncover all of these detective type of clues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left for us in the Quran and it leaves the heart dancing because you're really engaging the Quran as it should be engaged. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. We continue with the next part, evidence that Maryam was indeed Yahya's mother. There are two parallel accounts of the events that seem similar. This is the first thing you need to notice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as I said before, gave us two parts of the story. One in Ali Imran, Surah 3. One in Surah Maryam, Surah 19. Okay, Surah Maryam was revealed to our beloved much earlier than Surah Ali Imran. How do we know? Because Surah Ali Imran, which is Surah 3, includes a lot of details about war and about different engagements with the enemies and different facts and events that came later in the life of our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It couldn't have come before Surah Maryam. So Surah Maryam clearly came first. Surah Maryam had a partial account, but it didn't cover all the clues. It didn't give us all the answers. So for over 10 years, approximately by my count, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left the Muslims with only a part of the story. The rest of the story came in Surah Ali Imran, which is Surah number 3. And we're going to discuss both descriptions of the same story in the two different surahs in full detail. Partly in this segment, partly in the segment to come. So, the first part from Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Zakariya. 
زكريا ساز قال رب أن يكون لي غلام غلام وكانت امرأتي عاقرا as we saw before مريم in سورة مريم also سورة 19 she says قالت أن يكون لي غلام using the same marking غلام غلام okay notice here there is no ربي there is ربي in this part there is ربي in this part there is ربي in this part so who is she talking to in here we're gonna see this is part of what we're gonna reveal in the next segment inshallah but for now I need you to pay attention it's right there missing from otherwise four ayat that almost say the same thing and in the Quran what's missing is just as important as what's there and you have to pay attention observation skills is everything you have to be here not anywhere else shut down your cell phone shut down your tv don't let anyone disturb you as you're engaging the words of allah this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you closer to him by letting you see look this is missing i didn't put it there on purpose had the quran been modified while being copied they would have been really tempted to add this one. Very easy and very justifiable. No one did because Allah is preserving the Quran. It's beautiful, baby. It's beautiful. Three ayat that say, Rabbi, this one does not. Clear, clear evidence that something is missing and Allah is pointing us. Pay attention. She's not talking to Allah. She's not talking to the angels. She's talking to a human being as we will see, inshallah. All right. So she said, Ghulam, this is the marking that's really important. That means what happened to Zakaria with regard to Yahya is what's being discussed in Ayah 20 with regards to Maryam. So that means it's not talking about Isa. No, this part is talking about Yahya. Now we go to Surat Ali Amran. Again, the similar kind of pairing. Zakaria is saying, Qala Rabbi anna yakunu li ghulamun. Whom is he talking about? Yahya. The part where Maryam comes in and says, قَالَتْ Rabbi, Now she's talking to Allah. أَنَّ يَكُونُ لِي وَلَدٌ وَلَدٌ نَدْ غُلَامٌ Now she's talking about somebody else. This is Isa. This part right here is Isa. The first three are clearly about Yahya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala added a little more details in Surah Ali Imran to kind of see if we're really paying attention. But this time she used walad. So the scene that we're going to see about the new announcement of a new baby for her is about Isa in Surah Ali Imran. In Surah Maryam, it's Ghulam. Guess why she was selected twice? We will see. Because the first time was with Yahya, the second one was with Isa, and they are from the same parents as we will see, and they are brothers, and both of them are hers. So as I promised you, there are a lot of disclosures in this segment. And I hope you're keeping track of how many new things we're sharing with you because we're going to continue. We have a long segment ahead of us. So again, find yourself a comfortable place and keep going. If you need to take a break, take a break, but come back. You, you deserve this. You owe it to yourself and to your children to teach them the right story. Now, how do we know the last sentence in here? is talking about walad, is talking about Isa, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this as a marking when discussing Isa in Surah An-Nisa 4, 171. يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمِ It's talking about Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, etc, etc, etc. إِنَّمَا اللَّهُ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ سُبْحَانَهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ وَلَدْ Allah is but a single deity. There is only his way which negates that he has a walad. Walad is always used in reference to Isa. This is the reference right here. And this is the exact same word that's used in Surat Ali Imran. Beautiful integration, beautiful consistency. This is the Quran. Bring us what you have against the Quran. Throw it at us and let's see if what you have can even come close to one inch of what the Quran has to offer. This is the beautiful consistency in the Quran. Nowhere to make a mistake if you are paying attention. Only if you follow the erroneous stories, we stand to defeat our own Quran. If you follow the Quran as I'm showing you, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you al-izzah. وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ You are the upper ones if you are believers, if you really truly submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. Unbelievable, undeniable evidence that I'm sharing with you. So we continue with a reading of the story of Zakaria and Maryam and we're going to start with Ali Imran, which came later as I told you. Remember, Ali Imran came later. Surah Maryam came approximately 10 years earlier. So we're going to start with the later one. So we gather some clues and then we go apply them to Surah Maryam. Some of you are going to ask, well, how did the early companions understand? Who told you they understood everything? Where did you get this concept from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing them just as he is still testing us today. Those of them who stuck by our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa showed unbelievable determination and faith in the messenger. And they stuck with him even though they had probably a million questions they did not know how to respond to. This is faith. You see it in front of your eyes. If you don't understand something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. So we read from Surah Ali Imran first so that we can get the clues and then we go back and apply them to Surah Maryam. We start with Surah 3, Ayah 33. إن الله اصطفى آدم ونوحا وآل إبراهيم وآل عمران على العالمين. Indeed, Allah selected Adam and Nuh and the followers of Ibrahim and the followers of Imran in line with all the realms. We will have a lot more to say about this ayah in the next segment, so stay tuned. I promise you there are some disclosures that will change a lot of things we were told. And again, when I keep saying we need to reinterpret the whole Quran, you're going to see it for yourself. There are so many beautiful, amazing details given in every word in the Quran. And inshallah, we will deal with this ayah a lot more in the next part, part three of this series. A progeny, some of them are from some, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the hearing and provides the evidence-based knowledge. Now I want you to pay attention to something already. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a clue. ذُرِّيَّةً بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بعض. What are we talking about? Ala Ibrahim includes the community where Zakaria was from. Remember, Maryam ran away from her people, from Ali Imran, and came to the community where Zakaria was. And she took refuge with him and he was her mentor. And as I just described, she was with him all the time. So therefore, that means she was his woman. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, Ala Ibrahim, the people of Zakaria, and Ala Imran, the people of Maryam, intermarried ذُرِّيَّةً بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بعض. They're a progeny, some of them are from some others. Again, in the same surah, surah Ali Imran, the same expression, بَعْضُكُمْ مِنْ بعض, clearly describes this detail that I'm sharing with you. So right away in ayah 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, pay attention, we're telling you the story of who is a child of whom, and who is the parent of whom, etc., etc. Who is the progeny from whom? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he selected Adam and Nuh and Ali Ibrahim and Ali Imran. Again, there's a lot more detail coming in part three. So hold your horses a little bit on this ayah. But understand that already Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he selected them when, if, when the subordinate woman from Imran, meaning the mother of Maryam, as we shall see, said, my Lord, I am dedicating or I have dedicated what's in my belly emancipated, muharraran, and thus, except from me, you are the provider of hearing, the provider of evidence-based knowledge, as samia al-alim. Pay attention to this expression, because it's going to happen again, and it's already happened right here, samia on alim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing to our attention that this dhurriya, this progeny, happened as a result of the dua, the dua of whom? Ba'd from this side, some of them from this side, and Ba'd from that side, some of them from the other side. So what do we know so far? We know that Zakaria made a dua. We know that the mother of Maryam, Imra'ata Imran, before she delivered Maryam, as we will see in Ayah 36, she made a dua for her and for Maryam. The dua from Maryam's mom is cited in here for Allah to tell us, think, 
what she asked for, we gave her. Therefore, you have to accept it. فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا When she delivered her, قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى She said, My Lord, I have delivered her as a female. وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعَتْ And Allah is the best provider of knowledge regarding what she delivered. Meaning, Allah already knew this, but we can't translate it this way. We have to translate it in a way that ascribes due reverence to Allah. So we say Allah is the best provider of knowledge regarding what she delivered. And the male is not like the female. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى I already showed you an example where you have to give preference to the feminine Allah to Kalima is not talking about you, male Zakaria. It's talking about her feminine woman, third person, Maryam. I hope it's already starting to come together. So as you see, the Quran gives us clues, and the clues are for those who are attentive, aware, paying attention. Wa inni sammaituha Maryam, and I have named her Maryam. Wa inni u'idhuha bika wa dhurriyataha min ash-shaytan rajim and I seek refuge in you for her and for her progeny. Progeny, multiple. So right away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the dua that she made was for multiple. Multiple what? Multiple children, as you will see, as we said. So it wasn't just one son. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her just one son, don't you think that he would have told us the dua about one son? Of course. Allah told us zurriya, multiple. That's why, because we need to pay attention that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us later in ayah 37, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted her. That means he accepted the supplication from her mom. وَإِنِّي أُعِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَّتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ From the shaytan who is rajim, i.e. liable to cast people away from a direct connection with Allah. Ayah 37. فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيَّا كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَّا الْمِحْرَابِ وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقًا قَالَ يَا مَرْيَمُ أَنَّا لَكِ هَذَا قَالَتْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حساب. You really need to really pay attention to this one. This is one of the most stunning ayat about this whole story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. So her Lord accepted her, meaning Allah accepted Maryam, taqabbalaha, taqabbala Maryam, biqabulin hasanin, by her insightful acceptance. What do you mean by her insightful acceptance? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted Maryam because of Maryam's acceptance to the insights of the scripture. So remember, she came to Zakaria to learn, to run away from the ignorance that existed back in her homeland. So she came to Zakaria and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had her put under the mentorship of Zakaria. Zakaria, as we saw, is a very pious person, very learned, a leader in his own community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, Every time Zakaria approached her in trying to teach her of the tabernacle of Al-Mihrab. Pay attention to this one. Kullama dakhala alayha Zakaria Al-Mihrab. That means Zakaria approached her to give her something or to request something or to teach her. Right? That's what dakhala alayha. It doesn't mean physically entered where she was. It may mean that, but in general, the Quran, if you review all of the places where dakhala ala and dakhalu ala, it's usually with a request or with an offer or with an assistance of some sort or teaching that kind of feeling for the word dakhala ala. Approached her in trying to teach her of the tabernacle, meaning anything he learned from al-mihrab, he found her with sustenance, rizq. They told us the rizq includes fruits and includes this and that and some vegetables and some bread. And Zakaria would not know where all of this food was coming from. Already putting a question mark, by the way. Hint, hint. No, it's not like that. Rizq in the Quran is described as spiritual sustenance, meaning knowledge, meaning new ideas, meaning new learnings and revelations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide. How do we know this? Her answer. Her answer gives us the answer. We don't need to make it up. So Zakaria would ask, Oh Maryam, how come you have this? Anna laki How come you have this? And she would say, 
It is from the dominion of Allah. Min indillah, from the dominion of Allah. Allah is not sending you bananas and apples and, and um, walnuts and almonds and all of this stuff they told us about in the tafsir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending her the knowledge, the understanding. And she continues, Indeed, Allah provides sustenance for whom wills to be receiving such sustenance without bound. All you have to do is to will it, to work for it, to seek it, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely. And as Maryam is telling Zakaria, Allah gives you anything you ask for. So already we see a beautiful relationship based on this love of knowledge between Maryam and Zakaria to the point where Zakaria is going to teach her and he finds that she knows already some things. And he asks, where are you getting this from? Where is this coming to you? Of course he would know, but he wanted to make sure that no one else is coming and teaching her behind his back. Of course, she was with him all the time. That's why he's asking, how come you have all of this? And she would answer the right answer. She would say, it's from Allah and Allah gives without bounds. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all without bounds. And this is the beautiful part. There Zakaria supplicated his Lord saying, My Lord, grant me from your ways a volitional progeny. We talked about volition in the prior two segments, especially in the segment about Ayatul Kursi. Please go back to that one. It's really an important concept and term. So Zakaria is saying, Give me from your ways a volitional progeny, tayyiba, willingly following you. Inna ka samia dua again samia, and we saw this earlier in here samia and samia. All of these markings, Allah subhanahu wa taala is telling us, pay attention. This is all about these dua that are being made, one by Zakaria, one by the the woman from Imran, and so on and so forth. So therefore, the progeny that he's about to tell us about is all related to all of these dua. And notice how they're starting to be interweaved. And notice something else. Hunalika, at that specific point, after Maryam told him, it is from Allah who gives whoever wills without bounds. That's exactly when Zakaria says, this is the woman I want for my children. This is the woman I wish I can have my children with her. So that's why he made the dua and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us there at that point he made the dua. So now you see this explains the parts from Surah Maryam where it didn't say this. This clue was kept from us in Surah Maryam which came before if you remember. Therefore the companions did not know everything. For a long time they did not know the interpretation of Surah Maryam until Surah Al-Imran came most of them did not understand Surah Maryam. Did our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understand it? Allah knows. Because Surah Al-Imran provides critical clues without which you cannot understand Surah Maryam. So we continue. هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَ رَبَّهُ قَالَ رَبِّ هَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ ذُرِّيَةً طَيِّبَةً إِنَّكَ سَمِيعُ الدُّعَاءِ فَنَادَتْهُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي فِي الْمِحْرَابِ and the angels called upon him while he was persistent in Salat, in the tabernacle, in the place of prayer inside the community location, that Allah gives you the glad tidings about Yahya, affirming a kalima. In Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya, musaddikan bi kalimatin min Allah. Affirming a kalima, meaning an accepted supplication. Why? Just be patient, I'm going to show you. Kalima means an accepted supplication from Allah and a household leader, Sayyidan. As we saw already, she pointed to him, Asharat ilay. She gave him the leadership opinion, Asharat, Shura. He owns that answer. He owns the conversation with her people when she returned to her people with Yahya. So this is Yahya described as Sayyidan, the leader of his household. Hasuran, they told us that means he could not have children. That's not true. They told us that he would not marry. That's also not true. The word Hasuran from Hasr 
or in Arabic we say hasri, that means exclusive, that means he's keeping to himself some knowledge, some secrets. Which secrets? We're going to see in part three. Every single word in the Quran is giving us a whole bunch of information that is really essential to understand the overall picture. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us he is hasuran, that means he's keeping the secret. And he shall be asked, as we will see, to keep a very important secret about the story of Isa that we will discuss in part three. وَنَبِيًّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Confirming that the person who spoke to Maryam's community when she returned to them was a Nabi, and this is Yahya. Very clear. Again, the evidence is right there. Just look. All you have to do is look at the evidence. You have to empty your cup. If you're attached to what you were taught as a child, you're not going to accept the Quran. If you throw away that stuff and start with the Quran, assume you've never heard the story before. This is what the story is telling us. The same person who spoke to Maryam's community is a Nabi, and that's Yahya right there. قَالَ رَبِّ أَنَّا يَكُونُ لِي غُلَامٌ وَقَدْ بَلَغَنِي الْكِبَرُ وَامْرَأَتِي عَاقِرٌ Exactly the same expressions that we saw before. How would I have a gulam, a young man, while the elders have reached an escalation with me, meaning as we saw before, al-kibar, that means the elders, and we described this in part one. Go back to that one if you're questioning what we're doing here. While the elders have reached an escalation with me, and while my subordinate woman, in this case we know, it's Maryam, has been pinned down, frozen in place, prevented from walking about, etc. He said, Allah said, كَذَلِكَ, that's exactly how. It is you and her, you're forced to be together, you're going to have children together. This is exactly how. Allah carries out whatever He wills. And then the ayah 41 comes, which we've already explained. قَالَ رَبِّ جَعَلْ لِي آيَةً قَالَ آيَتُكَ أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ النَّاسَ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ إِلَّا رَمْزًا He says, your sign is that she remains silent for three days except in signals. So what kind of a sign is this? Well, they're living together and she's going to have three solid days of not talking to him at all, at all. No words whatsoever coming out of her mouth. And as soon as Zakaria will recognize that she's doing that, by the promise of Allah, he will know that she's agreeable, that she is willing to have the child. We're going to see some more details. And it's kind of playful and a little bit funny, but it's really a beautiful, tender, very engaging story, as you see. وَاذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ كَثِيرًا وَسَبِّحْ بِالْعَشِيِّ وَالْإِبْكَارِ As I said, this is a proof, engage the dhikr a lot and follow the way in prayer during evenings and mornings. This is exactly why we said فَأَوْحَى إِلَيْهِمْ in Surah Maryam is Allah enjoining them to do the prayers during the evenings and the mornings. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ Now we're starting a new part of the story. We finished with the story of Zakaria and how he came to know the future coming of Yahya. Now we are starting the part about Maryam. Notice that in Surat Al-Imran, in Surat Maryam, and also in Surat Al-Anbiya, they're always together. This is a family group and their stories are always told together and this is no coincidence because they were one family. So we continue with Surah 3, Ayah 42. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ and the angel said, O oh Maryam, Allah has selected you, first time, with Yahya, and purified you, cleansed you, meaning you got rid of those who are chasing you and harassing you. We're going to see this. And selected you again, selected you again upon all the women in all the realms, all the domains. So she is the number one woman in accordance with the Quran, Maryam, nobody else. Don't let anybody fool you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected her twice. No one, no one has been selected like Maryam has been selected. And she's been selected over or upon all the human women. Ala nisa il alameen. Ya Maryam uqnuti li rabbiki wasjudi warka'i ma'ar raki'in. This is the really ticklish part of this story. O Maryam, 
practice silence. Eknoti, practice silence. Practice silence, they told us Eknoti means something else. You're going to see it. I'm going to show you directly from the dictionary. It was right there in front of their eyes. They want to refuse anything the Quran is telling us and they want to stick to the story they imported from the corrupted Injil. Please make sure you understand they're lying. The Quran told us they're lying. This is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uqnuti li rabbiki. Wasjudi warka'i ma'ar raki'in. Make sure you practice silence for the sake of your Lord. What is the ayah that he was given that she would remain silent for three days? So here the angels call her, called her. And remember, this is before the first selection. This is before the first child. So the angels told her, you need to practice silence. Now, where do I get this from? Let's go down to the dictionary, Lisan al-Arab. And this is not unique, by the way. You can look up any dictionary that's self-respecting, very comprehensive and goes back in history. You will find a very similar this definition. Qanata, qanata is a verb that means imsak an al-kalam, to abstain from speaking. والقنوت الخشوع والإقرار بالعبودية it was given some religious dimensions and then he continues with this report زيد بن الأرقم said we used to talk during our prayers during salat حتى نزلت وقوموا لله قانتين the same verb make sure you establish yourself or you persist in what you're doing قانتين silent in your prayer فأمرنا بالسكوت we were commanded to remain quiet. Qanitin. So these reports, I don't mind taking the linguistic value of these reports. Whether or not these reports are perfect, I don't care. But the fact that they were reported very early back in history tells us that the word Qanata, as we are defining it in here, literally means that. Imsak anil kalam. Preventing yourself or abstaining from speaking. So Maryam is being told, stop talking. For a while, وَسْجُدِي وَرْكَعِي مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ And bow down and prostrate with those who do these movements. Are you paying attention? I just dropped a huge hint. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this type of hint? We will see inshallah later. But pay attention and learn. مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ Those who bow down. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the angels is telling Maryam, stick with Zakaria. Because remember, she is Aqir. She is already there. He's telling her, don't go away. Don't reject. Don't refuse what Zakaria is going to bring to you. And then the amazing part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces ayah number 44 right in the middle of all of the story. This, meaning the story of Maryam and Isa and Zakaria and Yahya recounted in this story, is an account of truth that's beyond disclosure, behind disclosure. It was not disclosed before. Ghaib. Ghaib. Memorize this word. It is the most potent piece of information that the Quranic stories are different than the biblical erroneous stories. Ghaib. These stories are ghaib. They were not known to anyone. And they're still not known to them. And by the way, not known to the vast majority of Astaghfirullah, us Muslims. We have not disclosed this before. Did someone know these stories before? Of course, Maryam and Zakaria themselves knew. But these stories were lost in history. So by the time the Quran was being revealed, no one knew these stories. They were ghaib. Nuhihi ilayk. We enjoin you to follow some guidance from these stories. And by the way, O Muhammad, you were not there. You were not listening to them. Ladayhim. This is what ladayhim means, listening to them. Listening to whom? We're going to see. As they cast their lots, meaning they drew lottery kind of thing, competing who would end up being a mentor over Maryam. And you are not listening to them as they were arguing over Maryam. Hmm, what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that Zakaria is no longer in the picture. Why? We're not told probably died, maybe killed even. Remember, he was already complaining of fearing these people around him, especially the elders. The elders of whom? The elders of his community from 
Ali Ibrahim, the followers of Ibrahim, who went astray, who were deviating in the way they were applying religion, in the way they're applying monotheism. And they're making themselves mawali, they're making themselves intermediaries between Allah and the people and the followers of the religion. He was afraid of them. So possibly they did something to harm him. They killed him. They disappeared him somehow. So therefore he's not part of the picture anymore. And the elders are competing as to who shall grab Maryam, who shall become quote unquote mentor over her. And I think you understand between the lines what's going on in here. And the evidence that their intentions were not good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inserts this word in this ayah, as they were arguing over her. That means they all saw a prize to be won, of course, after Zechariah was gone. So this ayah tells us a very, very critical piece of information. Number one, everything we've told you so far is part of ghayb. No one knew this. The second part is that Zechariah was no longer in the picture. And therefore, when you go back to read Surah Maryam, and she went with Yahya to her community. Why? She's escaping. She's running away from what we saw right here in Ayah 44. So the rabbis and the leaders of the Jewish community and the followers of Ibrahim, when they're corrupting the monotheism, when those leaders started competing over Maryam, she slipped away. She ran away back to the only place she knew, her old community. What about her son? She brought him with her. What about the other son? We're going to see, inshallah, just be patient. But at the point she went back with Yahya to her community, Zakaria was already gone. And that's why we saw Barran that He could only have constancy of faith through his own mother because his father was no longer in the picture. I hope the picture is starting to become a lot clearer. The Quran is giving us very, very clear indication. So with that, let's go back to Surah Maryam and read the same type of event, but from the point of view of Surah Maryam. Remember, Surah Maryam came earlier and therefore it had some missing pieces that Surah Ali Imran provided, as we saw, all right? such as the absence of Zakaria and so on and so forth. So now when we read about the approach between Zakaria and Maryam at the first time, at the first time Zakaria approached her for having a child, we're going to see some funny exchange and really interesting dynamic as to what's going on. We read from Surah Maryam, Ayah 16. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمْ إِذِنْ تَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيَّ And mention in the scripture Maryam, when she withdrew away from her cohorts, أَهْلَهَا, أَهْلِهَا as we see in here, to an eastern location. Why eastern? This shall become extremely relevant when we discuss the issues in the next part, inshallah. So remember, eastern, eastern from where she was. That means her community is westward of where Zakaria was. We will see what that means. فَاتَّخَذَتْ مِن دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا She established between her and them a shield. Who is that shield? That's Zakaria because he was protecting her. And she hid in his house with him all the time. فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّ And thus we sent to her our message, message, ruh, or messenger, remember both, in the word ruh, as I explained at the beginning of the segment. And he presented himself as a counterexample. تَمَثَّلَ لَهَا تَمَثَّلَ لَهَا Please pay attention to this word. This is going to be hard for those of you who are Arabic speakers especially the Arabic speakers, they don't really distinguish between tamathala versus tamathala la, la. There's an extra preposition. And as you know, with phrasal verbs, the meaning changes. When I say come in, and then I tell you come, or I tell you come out, or, the, or then I tell you come with, every one of those means something totally different. So when we use the verb mathal or tamathala or mathala, or mathalan, and then we follow it with this little preposition li, which could also mean against in Arabic, ala, right? So mathal or tamathala li, that means a counterexample, not an example. 
So darab Allahu mathalan lilladina amanu against those who believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave an example against those who believe. Against them how? Because he's giving the example of Imra'at Fir'aun. She was a woman that is surrounded by all sorts of horrible things and yet she was very, very highly praised in the Quran. So she's a counter example to the believers who claim that all of the non-believers are bad. No, there is among that community some individuals who may be really good. So it's a counter example to the believers who believe in us versus them. Group ID, group thinking. Same thing in here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying tamathala laha. So he was a counter example. What does that mean, a counter example? Now, put yourself in the mind frame of Maryam. Maryam has been receiving sustenance, rizq. And she told Zakaria, Inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha'u bi ghayri hisab. Allah provides sustenance, intellectual learning and knowledge and all of this understanding without account. Wonderful. So the angels are talking to her. That's how she received messages. That's how she received divine instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there's a counter example to that. What does that mean? That means the person who's speaking to her is not an angel. is a human being and she's not used to that. So it was a counter example to her, to what she is used to. So the first time, this is a human being telling her, I'm bringing a divine message from Allah. How do we know? You're going to see. It's so playful. It's so much fun to really be able to see all of these nuances and details. فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا Our messenger carrying a specific message. You're going to see the message. You're going to see the message with your own eyes. Exact message that Allah gave him. He carried her. Just like we saw in the messenger in the story of Yusuf. When he brought the report from the king, he reported it verbatim. We're going to see exactly verbatim what the angels told Zachariah is what he told her. We're going to see it. So Ruhana is Zachariah himself. He approached her. That was a counter example to what she believed, meaning she believed only the angels from Allah gave her messages from Allah. In this case, it is Basharan, a human being. A proportioned human being, meaning an acceptable human being. So Zachariah was not old. Zachariah was not near the age that they told us about. Zachariah was a relatively healthy man, sawiyan, established, firm. So there was no problem with Zachariah. So now you're in the frame of mind of Maryam. She is seeing Zachariah come to her and telling her, Hey, guess what? We're going to have a kid by the command of Allah. He is a ruh. He is a messenger from Allah. And she says, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, you're, you're, you're not the example I'm used to. So watch what she's going to tell him. She said, قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك. I seek refuge in Ar-Rahman from you. That's his language, by the way. Ar-Rahman. I think that you have been naughty. You have been undisciplined. You have not been disciplined. In, in other words, taqiyan, pious as you have presented or claimed before. So she says, قَالَتْ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَنِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيًّا This is a, an accusation against him. By the way, to my Arabic-speaking brothers and to those who read the translations, very, very erroneous translations is what they did. In is not a conditional in here. In, in Arabic, sometimes comes as a negation instrument. You have not been taqi. So I say, in Sa'idun Ja'i' that means Sa'id is not hungry. This is this is very eloquent Arabic, by the way. Those of you who are not familiar with it, go study. If I say in Sa'idun Ja'i' that means Sa'id is not hungry. If I say in Sa'idun La Ja'i' that means Sa'id is hungry. So this is the beauty and the intricacy of the Arabic. So in here, in Kunta Taqiyan, you have not been Taqi, you have not been pious, you have not been disciplined as you claimed. So why did she have this rejection? Because she wasn't expecting someone so close to her to bring her a divine message and make that claim. And we're going to see. We're going to see he made that claim of being a messenger from Allah. And it's not a claim. It's true. Because he was commanded by Allah to give her a specific reference, a keyword, so to speak. And she did. Now remember, she has been already practicing silence. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her to practice silence without necessarily telling her the full details. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about to share with her the news that she's going to have a ghulam, but this news is coming through Zakaria. So watch very carefully now. He said, I am Rasulu Rabbiki. Innama ana Rasulu Rabbiki. I am but a messenger, meaning I only carry a message to grant you a purification seeking ghulam, zakiyan. Again, this is a marking. Zakat and Tazkiyah and Zakiyan. This is all a marking about Yahya. So we're talking about Ghulam who is Yahya. So Zakaria is telling her, I'm here to grant you a Ghulam Zakiyan. How to grant you? Well, okay, fill in the blank, okay? Qalat anna yakunu li ghulam. She answered him without saying Rabbi, without saying Rabbi as we explained earlier. In the other three instances with similar expressions, there is Rabbi. Here, she's talking to Zakaria, who is not her Rabb, is not her Lord. She is his woman, meaning she's under his protection. But it doesn't mean they were having fornication or astaghfirullah, or they were having any kind of sexual relationship. And that's why he was so sensitive to her needs and making sure he doesn't come over and, you know, force himself upon her. So he asked for the sign and the sign that she would remain silent, practice silence for three days and three nights. And of course, he saw the signs and approached her. But she said, how shall I have a ghulam, the same word, a young man, and yet I have not been harmed by any human being and I have not been a harlot. Now, yamsasni, yamsasni is a very critical word. We were taught and we were told in the book of Tafsir, Yam Sasni, that means had intercourse or had some sort of conjugal relationship with people. It's not true. Read the Quran. Evaluate how the Quran uses these words. Let's go down. And I'll only give you a couple of examples from Surah Ali Imran. We don't need to go very far in the same Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the exact same verb. Yam Saskum. Yam Sasni is what she said. Yam Saskum. What does that mean? You are harmed or affected by pain. Yam saskum qarhun. Go read the translations. This is made correctly. In this case, in the case of Maryam, they all made it up to be sexual relationship. Where did you come up with it? The Quran does not make you choose sexual versus non-sexual. In here, he gives you an example that it's not sexual. So it's their X-rated minds. I'm sorry to say, but this is the truth. They only see what they want to see. Subhanallah. Here's another example from Ayah 174. Lam su'un. They were not harmed. Again, there are many, many other examples. Search for them in the Quran, you'll find them. The verb yamsas does not necessarily mean have sexual relationship. So she says, how am I going to have ghulam when I haven't had anyone, bashar, attack me? And in her mind, that was the only way for her to become pregnant. That means being raped. I was not raped nor did I go seeking it. Baghiyan, I did not go offer myself for that. So if I wasn't forced and I didn't go to offer myself to anybody else, how am I going to have a child? And then his answer is exactly what the angels told him. It's exactly like you just said. It's exactly like you think. We are here. That's it. And then he continues with the verbatim message he was given to tell her. قَالَ رَبُّكِ هُوَ عَلَيَّ هَيِّنٌ She understood this message. How? We're not told. But this is clear evidence that he carried verbatim a message that she was given earlier, probably when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angels to tell her to practice silence. وَلِنَجْعَلَهُ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ Ah, this is a marking. This is a marking to whom? To the man who died a hundred years who is also Yahya. وَرَحْمَةً مِنَّا And a mercy from us. وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْضِيَّ And this whole thing was a decreed matter. Meaning it was completely completed as explained. Meaning the end of the story of Yahya in this surah. Of course, another part of Yahya will come later when she returns to her people with Yahya as I just demonstrated. Now we go back to a... Now we go to wrap up. This question, why is the female preferred to the male? If you remember in Ayah 36, 
فلما وضعتها قالت رب إني وضعتها أنثى والله أعلم بما وضعت وليس الذكر كالأنثى وإني سميتها مريم وإني أعيذها بك وذريتها من الشيطان الرجيم And when she delivered her, she said, My Lord, I have delivered her as a female, and Allah is the best provider of knowledge regarding what she delivered, and the male is not like the female. So why is my question preferred to the male? Because in Arabic, when you say X is not like Y, usually Y is better than X. So you say apples are not as good as watermelon, or they're not like watermelon. That means you prefer the watermelons in general, of course. So here it's really not a preference in general, but this is a preference in linguistics. So what a dhakar also means the masculine, and al untha means the feminine. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying the masculine is not like the feminine. Think of the feminine first. Approach. your interpretation of the Qur'an by thinking of the feminine first. So when we want to apply this parenthetical clause, and we came to this ayah, ayah 10 from Surah Maryam, قَالَ رَبِّ جَعَلْ لِي آيَةً My Lord designate a sign for me. He said, his Lord said, Allah, آيَتُكَ أَلَّا تُكَلِّمَ Your sign is that she remains silent. So now it makes perfect sense. So in the selection between the two possible tafsil of this expression, Allah to kalima, don't stick to the masculine because the masculine is not like the feminine. The feminine is better in this case. As I said before, we will apply the same instrument of extracting evidence, tafsil and bayinat, in part three, which is coming up, inshallah, after this part. So now, I want to deal with a couple of issues that we have been hit with very hard against the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah At-Tahreem, Surah 66, number 12, gives us this ayah. وَمَرْيَمَ بْنَتَ عِمْرَانِ أَلَّتِي أَحْصَنَتْ فَرْجَهَا فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ We breathed or we blew into it, it. And the closest word that applies is farjaha. Farjaha, for those of you who know Arabic, is usually interpreted as private part. So we blew into it. Is this what we were told in the Quran? No. But that's how most of the interpreters thought about this. Now I want to share with you an amazing, amazing, simple concept that really takes away all of these issues, puts things in line to ascribing to Allah his due reverence. So the translation that I give, and Maryam, the daughter from Imran, from Imran, notice I didn't say of Imran, I know Imra'at Imran means the woman of Imran, but it's not necessarily a single person. We will deal with this next part, I promise you. Again, all sorts of things are changing in this story, and you're going to learn amazing things. The daughter from Imran who guarded her cavity. What do you mean cavity? Yes, cavity. That's all the word farj means. It means cavity. You want proof? Look at this ayah, 56. أَفَلَمْ يَنْظُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَوْقَهُمْ كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا وَزَيَّنَّاهَا وَمَا لَهَا مِنْ فُرُوج فُرُوج is the plural of farj. Now, it's talking about sama. You want to see it as the physical sama up above you. or the layers of understanding, either way is fine. It is metaphorical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has nothing to do with the private parts of the heavens or the private parts of the layers of understanding. It's the exact same word used. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it has no cavities, no openings, no crack, no breaks. It is consistent, coherent. So any crack or any opening or any cavity is described as farj. Farj does not mean only private parts. It could include private parts. And if your mind is X-rated, astaghfirullah, that's the only thing you think about. But this word is not exclusive to the private parts. So what is this ayah saying? She protected, ahsanat, she guarded her cavity. Which cavity? فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ We breathed into it. Ah, breathed into it. So beautiful, it's talking about this cavity right here, the ear. 
Is this a cavity? Yes, it is an opening into the inside of your body. You all know this. We have another cavity and we have other cavities. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the exact same word and I included this explanation in the reminders at the top of this segment. If you have skipped, you did not get it. And it was breathed or blown into the curved instrument. The exact same verb. In this cavity right here. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the hearing, which I've been telling you about the days and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers the messages to those who are muttaqoon and those who are in jannat. So we breathe in it of our ruh, of our divine message. Yes, the angels were talking to her. And we saw this again and again in Surah Al-Imran and Surah Maryam. So now it's no longer a mystery. What is Allah talking about in here? Just get yourself out of the old crappy stories that we received. وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهِ And she affirmed the kalimat, meaning the supplications that were dignified by her Lord and his scripture. And she was among those who practice devotional silence. So someone asked me, kalimat, how do you know this is about the dignified supplications because in here we have an ayah from surah yunus ayah 82 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us now we know kalimat are part of the words of the quran we know this and we've talked about this before but what is really the intended meaning of the word she believes in his word. Does it mean believes the scripture? No, it's more than that. She believes in the supplication power of using these words. So in this ayah, 82 from Surah Yunus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, use these words and Allah will make it real. In other words, Allah will respond to your supplication, will dignify your supplication. So, صَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِهِ she believed in the dignified supplications that result from the words of the scripture that she was studying. And that's why, وَكُتُبِهِ His scriptures. وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ Why did it say كُتُبِهِ? Because there was the book of Musa, Torah, and there were others that we will learn about, inshallah, when we discuss the rest of the story of Isa. Now, wait, 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 wait. You mean all of this stuff you've been telling me Maryam was not a virgin when she had Isa? No, we were told it's a miraculous birth, virgin birth. Maryam al Adra, you know, she was not touched by anyone. This is Aqeedah. Who are you to mess with our Aqeedah, Dr. Hani? You're deviant. You're changing everything. You're changing our deen. Wait, slow down. Slow down. Aqeedah is what the Quran tells us is Aqeedah. Aqeedah is not what we bring from the corrupted versions of earlier scriptures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us they don't know anything. They don't know nothing about him. Everything they say is a lie. The Quran is our Aqeedah. Wake up. Don't follow someone who tells you this is part of Aqeedah. No, our Aqeedah is what the Quran tells us. And I just showed you the evidence. You want to accept it, you want to reject it, it's up to you. But don't accuse me of giving you anything outside the Quran. I'm following the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ghaib. Ghaib is what Allah revealed in the Quran. And therefore we believe the Quran a million times, a billion times before we believe anybody else. Our Aqeedah according to the Quran is believing in Allah. The messengers, this is believing in the messengers. This is believing in the message that our beloved brought. If you don't believe the message that our beloved brought to you and me, then you don't believe in the messengers, Rusul. That means you're violating the Aqeedah. If you don't believe in the angels, as I just showed you, that means you're violating the Aqeedah. If you don't believe in the veracity of the Quran, the Ghaib, the Day of Judgment, all of these things we've talked about, a little bit throughout this story. If you don't believe this story, as I just shared it with you, you're the one who's violating your Aqeedah. Aqeedah is exclusively based on what Allah told us. It is not based on what was brought from the corrupted earlier scriptures. I hope it's really clear. Future questions that we will deal with, inshallah, we're not done yet. We have a couple of beautiful portions left in this segment. So inshallah, I want to share with you just a few of the questions that we will discuss in future parts of this series. 
One of them is who was Adam in Surah 3 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Allah astafa Adam who was this Adam in Surah 3 and you're going to see it yourself. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in mathala Isa عند الله كمثل Adam the example of Isa is like the mathal or the example of Adam. This Adam again in Surah Ali Imran who is he talking about and what kind of similarity are we talking about? Or are we going to go back to the assumption that Adam was created from poof and be out of thin air as they taught us and as we disproved in the prior series that we shared with you the story of Adam? No, of course, it's not the Adam that was created out of nothing. It is the Adam that the Quran told us about. And specifically in this case, Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us clear indication who this Adam is and we will share it inshallah in the next part of this series. Who was Imran? What does Turab mean? What is Jidhun Nakhla that the part of Surah Maryam refers to? We will detail these issues in part 3 and please don't ask anything about them in the comments below. I know you're thinking them. I know you're worried about them. I promise you the answers are very stunning and beautiful and so direct and clear evidence and you're going to see it as we saw in this segment everything in front of us it's just we need to engage the quran now why were we told about yahya what's the importance of this story why does the quran repeatedly refer to him again and again i want to start by sharing with you three ayat from surah al-infitar surah 82 surah 82 ayah 6 it says, Ya ayyuhal insanu ma gharraka bi rabbika al-kareem. O directly guidable man, what has enticed you to take for granted your generous Lord? Alladhi khalaqaka fasawaka fa'adalaka. In another reading, fa'adalaka. And my Arab speaking brothers know exactly the impact of this. I translate it as, who created you, meaning your, your generous Lord, who created you, Balance you and adjusted or modified you. في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. In whatever form, and I'm stopping, putting a question mark here. I'll explain it in just one second. Whatever he willed, he made you ride ركبك. So we have several problems to overcome in this explanation, but I will go over them very quickly. First of all, ما this ما in here. According to the traditional translation and the traditional interpretation, this ma is superfluous, extraneous. It is not needed. In other words, if you read the interpretation, you read the translation, and you take this word ma out of this ayah, nothing changes. That means their interpretation is wrong. Let me repeat it. Anytime you can take a word out of an ayah and the interpretation does not change, the interpretation you're given does not change, that means their interpretation is wrong. That means you're saying Allah did not need to put this word in here. Allah is stuffing words in the Quran. The Quran has extraneous words. That's what, what it means when you accept their interpretation. So we don't accept interpretations that allow for that possibility. So ma is not extraneous. So we have to do a tafsil, a segmentation of the ayah in order to make sure this ma is not extraneous. So how do we do this? We take this part in here and it becomes a full sentence. Ma sha'a rakkabaka. Whatever he willed, he made you ride. Now why do I say he made you ride? Because the word rakaba in the Quran is exclusively used for riding. Like riding animals or riding cattle or riding whatever you ride. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively used this gerund for writing, not for composing an image. This is how they interpreted it. So they said, in whatever image he wanted, he composed you, he formed you. No, that's not what it means. Because that interpretation necessitates that ma is extraneous. So according to the Quranic methodology, there's no extraneous anything in the Quran. So we reject their interpretation and we stick to the veracity of the Quran. So therefore, fi ayi suratin belongs to the rest of the ayat above. Ya ayyuhal insan, O guidable man, what has enticed you to take for granted your generous Lord? Who created you, balanced you, and adjusted you, and modified you in whatever form? What does that mean, in whatever form? 
he's talking to Al Insan. Where did we see a reference to that? In many different ayat, but in Surah Abasa. Those of you who studied the interpretation or the series on Surah Abasa, you know that we use the word insan or the Quran used the word insan to refer to the man who died for a hundred years. This is Yahya. So these ayat are talking about Yahya. Yes, watch, watch. What enticed you to take for granted your generous Lord? Did Yahya do this? The man who died a hundred years did. Who created you and then balanced you and adjusted you and in accordance to one reading عدلك, modified you modified you in what في أي صورة, in any image meaning in multiple images so that means Yahya came back in a different image this is what these ayat are telling us I hope you appreciate the depth and the beauty of linking all of these ayat otherwise these ayat don't make any sense not only this we continue ما شاء ركبك whatever he willed Allah willed he made you ride ah ride because in the story from 2 259 of the man who died a hundred years the parable talks about your donkey وانظر إلى حمارك that means he was riding a donkey in Luqman we saw the worst of the noises is the collective brain of donkeys again a clear reference and a third reference to donkeys by the way in the Quran it's like the example of the donkey that's carrying tomes of scripture so he represented the donkey carrying the tomes of Yahya's books and scriptures in that part of the story so therefore whatever he made you ride is very much applicable to Yahya and to the man who died a hundred years did he appear in multiple images this is what this ayah is telling us this is something very significant stay with me because there's something even more significant coming watch this ayah from surat al-isra surah 17 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to our beloved please pay attention wake up this is serious indeed they were near to tempt you away from what we have enjoined upon you awhayna is not the revelation of the scripture pay attention i said wahi is the enjoinment the commands given do and don't for people who execute such as a prophet nabi not a messenger there is no mistakes in the commands given to the messenger he does not make mistake as a messenger in that role but in the role of the prophet as a nabi yes he does and a lot of the stories from sulaiman musa ibrahim many of the prophets we were told about made some mistakes that the quran revealed to us so here in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing something really crucial for us to understand and I'm not attacking our beloved I love him a lot more than you think I'm defending him a lot more than you think if he was alive I would be honored to be a speckle of dust under his doormat but here we're dealing with the Quran and what the Quran is telling us and teaching us about our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indeed they were near to tempt you away from what we enjoined upon you to concoct against us something else we saw before to concoct against us something else and then they would have accepted you as a conveyor Again, taftari is not talking about the message. The Quran has always been safe. It is about what he says of the explanation of the Quran. And that's why our beloved وسلم, made it a habit not to talk about translating or interpreting the Quran. So he was tempted to give his own explanation. And that would have been iftira. Why? Because it's limited to what he understood during his time. As our explanation is limited to what we understand during this time. We share our interpretations 
and understanding based on the methodology while being fully sure better interpretations will come in the future. I'm not a prophet. I'm not obligated to remain silent or a messenger to remain silent as our beloved was required. But this ayah is talking to a prophet. وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَفْتِنُونَكَ عَنِ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ Instructions given to a prophet. And therefore, وَلَوْلَا أَن ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرْكَنُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا And had we not given you steadiness, you were near to incline towards them just a little. شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا You were inclined. You were huh, starting to think that way. إِذَنْ لَأَذَقْنَاكَ and then we would have subjected you to what? ضعف الحياتي وضعف المماتي Multiple of life and multiple of death. What is this talking about? It's talking about the same thing that happened to Yahya. Oh, chills. Yes, absolutely. This is why the story of Yahya is so important. It was important to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a clear sign that you have the obligation to follow the instructions as we show you. If you decide to take it up to you and in your own hand and walk away from the mission, guess what will happen to you? The same thing that happened to the man who died a hundred years. He lived twice in different images and died multiple times and therefore multiple of life and multiple of death. I know the translations of this ayah are all over the place. But if you don't believe me, go check an English translator who is not a Muslim, who is not attached to any kind of defending or apologizing for the Quran. And he says, then we would have let you taste the double of life and the double of death. Well, the word double is not, is not accurate, multiple. So it could have been more than once. As a matter of fact, we will see eventually that Yahya suffered more than once. So there are a lot of lessons in here and the importance of the story of Yahya. This was not frivolous. I'm not sharing this with you for no reason. And therefore, what is the lesson we take away from this? The most important lesson we take away, remembering that Wahi is not about revelation of scripture. It's about enjoinments given to a prophet. Execute this, execute that, achieve this goal, follow through on this implementation. This ijtihad has nothing to do with the text of the scripture. The text of the Quran has always been ma'soom, protected, because he was Rasul in that role. Well, he's the same person. No, he's not the same person. Because you as a person, you have a role of a parent, and you have a role of an employee. If you make a mistake as an employee, it doesn't mean you're a bad person as a parent and vice versa. So these two roles are separate and we all have multiple roles and we have to really understand this. As a messenger, he was masum, but as a Nabi, he was not masum. And these ayat confirm this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him steadiness. Now the question is, well, you say, well, yeah, protected him, gave him steadiness. No, again, the Quran explains, the Quran tells us how he gave him the steadiness. So this ayah from Surah Al-Isra is telling us, وَلَوْلَا أَن ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِتَّ تَرْكَنُوا إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا Had we not given you steadiness, you were near to incline towards them just a little. But then the explanation of what it means, ثَبَّتْنَاكَ, we've given you steadiness, comes in Surah Hud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فؤادك. And all stories that we recount upon you from the accounts of the emissaries. Emissaries does not mean messengers, by the way. I know a rusul is the plural of Rasul, but in the Quran, sometimes the plural indicates something different than the singular. So emissaries in general, which could include prophets, are to give your perception steadiness, fu'ad, perception. So the fu'ad is what you perceive during your consciousness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, the news we gave you about the emissaries, prophets and messengers, were the way we gave you steadiness. That means we didn't force you. You still had to make your own independent free will type of choice. Free will type of choice as a Nabi. 
as a Nabi, he had the free will. He was liable to make mistakes, yes. Even a hadith, if you believe in the hadith and you don't like what I'm saying, go back to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which says, كُلُّ بْنَ آدَمَ خَطَّاءٌ Every descendant or every follower of Adam is liable to make mistakes. Or are you saying the Prophet himself was not from Bani Adam? You decide. The Prophet himself is telling you, كُلُّ بْنَ آدَمَ خَطَّاءٌ Every one of us, every human being is capable or liable to make mistakes. So these ayat are warning our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Had you made that mistake by your own free will, we would have subjected you to the same ending or the same result as what happened to the man who died a hundred years. And in case somebody is still questioning what we said so many times before that wahi is specific instructions to prophets, Nabi, not to messengers, not the message itself. Message itself is not wahi. The understanding and the instructions and what a prophet should execute and do is called wahi. Read this ayah from Surah An-Nisa. Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila nuhin wan nabiyyina min ba'dih. He's, here he's talking to our beloved as part of nabiyyin. And what happens to nabiyyin? Well, they were ended. That's it. He was the last of the Nabi, Nabiyyin. So therefore, this ayah tells us, Wahi, direct instructions to human beings after our beloved stopped. So what do we receive? We receive guidance. And guidance implies that you're free to follow it or not. So free will is preserved except for the message. Where it comes to a message, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivering a scripture Using a human being, that role, he has no free will. He is ma'asum. He cannot be touched, nor can he choose of his own what to reveal, what not to reveal. I hope the concept is really clear, and I would like to move to the closing of this segment. But Dr. Hani, how did you come up with all of this? And the answer, it's the methodology that sets me up to receive. This is what I've been telling you. The methodology does not unlock these concepts. The methodology gets you ready to receive. Well, how do you receive? It's like a dish, receiving from the satellite. In this case, I become a receptor to receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I follow, if I follow the right methodology, if I do self-correction, if I make sure that I'm not making mistake, that I'm disciplined in applying the methodology. This is exactly what we're saying in here. In Surah Al-Baqarah 2 to 69, Allah subhanahu wa confirms, يُؤْتِلْ حِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives hikmah to whomever he wills. In another way to read this, to whoever wills for hikmah to be given to him. And in conclusion, I want to wrap up with two things from why no mangoes or pineapple in the Quran. We read this ayah, وَفِي الْأَرْضِ قِطَعٌ مُتَجَاوِرَاتٌ وَجَنَّاتٌ مِنْ أَعْنَابٍ وَزَرْعٌ وَنَخِيلٌ صنوان وغير صنوان يسقى بماء واحد ونفضل بعضها على بعض في الأكل إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يعقلون Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the description that in the scripture there are parts that are in close proximity to each other surah or paragraph or stories etc. But then he gets to this expression صنوان وغير صنوان in that segment, we explained it, that all of these trees that he's talking about, which represent stories about messengers and prophets, they grow in family clusters or otherwise. Family clusters, I'm sure at that time you were surprised and I gave you a hint that we're going to see some stories about family clusters. Well, guess what? We have a family cluster. Zachariah, Isa. Maryam and Yahya, a cluster. Sinwan, Sinwan. So when we go back to this ayah and read it, there is no extraneous information in the Quran. Everything is relevant. The principle of relevance applies beautifully to everything we read in the Quran. So remember, no frivolous words or expressions in the Quran, no extraneous anything. Allah is not a poet. He's not stuffing words just for the sake of beautification or making adornments of the Quran. It looks to some people that it looks like poetry, but no, it's very real. And finally, we close with this. 
hopefully this is a heart melting conclusion to this long segment and I'm really sorry if this has pained you but I hope you have benefited from it. Eight lessons of endearment and tenderness among couples between Zachariah and Maryam and their children. First lesson, Zachariah was her mentor, the mentor for Maryam. He was diligent about teaching her, but Zachariah was actually learning from Maryam as we saw. Every time he approached her to teach her something from the mihrab, in the way he learned from al-mihrab, fil mihrab, he found that she is already too advanced for him. So he would say, Anna laki hadha, where are you getting this from? And she would say, from Allah. That means she was learning ahead of him. That's partly why he chose her. The second lesson, Maryam was feisty and protective and outspoken. In kunta taqiyya, you have not been pious as you claimed. A feisty woman, a woman who is outspoken, who is not shy as they described her. She is really protective of her intellect, protective of herself, a very perfect role model. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected her not once, but twice. This is the proper characteristic of a good mother. This is, this is observation number three. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Surah Ali Imran, هُنَالِكَ دَعَى زَكَرِيَّ رَبَّهُ When he saw what he saw from Maryam, he made a dua, please give me, O Allah, children like this. And Allah gave him better. He gave him children from her. Lesson number four, Zachariah was so sensitive to ensure her approval beforehand, as I explained. This is a beautiful part of this story that has been hidden from us, kept away from the training of our young men who should have studied the Quran correctly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us the higher role model of Zachariah. So we saw in part one, Zachariah was really a revolutionary who protected his mind and his heart and his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against those who are mawali, who want to make themselves intermediaries. In this segment, we saw Zakaria being the sensitive, loving, caring person who is very respectful of the dignity of a person he called my woman. So in the language, she was his woman, but in reality, she was a highly respected person to him. Beautiful, beautiful lessons. What does that imply to our own conjugal relationships? I'll let you reflect on this. Is this how we're training our boys? Is this how we're training our girls using these role models, Zachariah and Maryam? Now, if you understand this, do you still think the Quran advises men to beat their wives? Is this really consistent with what we just learned from Zachariah and Maryam and the tenderness and the endearment between them and the high level of respect? Of course not. That ayah 434 is not talking about beating. It's talking وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ That means separate them. It's the last step before divorce. And if you read the ayah after it, it is talking about divorce. So the three steps that are in 434 are first, وَعِذُوهُنَّ Preach to them, remind them. وَهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Keep them in their beds, but separate from them. And the third one is physically separate. وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ That means separate from their domicile. Totally a different home. That's the third and last step before the final step, which is divorce. So I hope you learn how to interpret all of these things together when we see the beautiful story of Zachariah with his woman, Maryam, and we apply it to the rest of the Quran. They must be consistent. They must be related to one another. Now, number seven, what do you think the implications are to claims about so-called women slaves? Do you think the Quran would encourage men to take women as slaves after a war? and treat them as if they didn't have a choice but to perform these sexual favors? Of course not. Of course not. This is the beauty of the Quran. It gives you the model that stands as a beacon, as a lighthouse. Everything shines because of it. And therefore you apply it, the stories, the dhikr. This is why we keep talking about dhikr. If you understand dhikr, you can shine a light on everything else. 
they went and tried to interpret everything else and kept dhikr hidden behind their back. They didn't want us to learn dhikr. If you learn dhikr, the whole Quran becomes so easy and mubin itself clarifies. And finally, the implications for the claims about our beloved's marriage to Aisha. Do you think our beloved وسلم, would do this to a nine-year-old? Or do you think that her own father, Abu Bakr, who understood this Quran, would do this to his own daughter? Of course not. They understood these things, and therefore they applied them in their life. And therefore, that reported erroneous story about our beloved وسلم. So these are the beautiful lessons that we take from this story of Zachariah and Maryam. This is my Quran. Now bring me, bring me what you think the Quran is talking about. And let's see if they compare. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the patience and the knowledge to continue learning from the Quran and the understanding to apply it in the proper way. And with this, we come to the closure of this segment and we make the dua. Join me, please. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada, wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah, laqad jaat rusul rabbina bilhaq. I thank you very much for watching and salamun alaykum.